Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. Richie, you got a lot to cover today. Uh, we're going to go through a recap of the Rutgers-Michigan game from this past Saturday. We got a new commitment, the first commitment of the class of 2024 for the football program. And we also have basketball opening night tonight. So a lot to cover, and we'll get started on that in a moment. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Basketball is back. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends on Bet Online. As your continued source for all your sports wagering info, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. It's always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. Uh, you can head to betonline.ag today to receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to enter the promo code BELIEVE, that's B L E A V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. And uh, as always, the podcast is also sponsored by Adam Goldman. He's the franchise coach. Basically, if you want to switch up your life, change up your career a little bit, tired of that nine to five job, um, he's, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, he could set you up with your own type of franchise, whether that be in the fast food business, uh, the medical business, or something else like that. Um, he's been doing it for 10 plus years now. So he, so he is uh, very experienced with this. Uh, Give him a call today, 844-800-3726, or visit his website, franchisecoach.net. Let's dive into this thing. <laughs> All right, so a lot of you guys went to this game on Saturday. Uh, it was a night game in Piscataway, probably the most exciting first half uh, for Rutgers in a long time. So Rutgers, you know, <clears throat> the first few drives of the game, Michigan looked like they were carving them up, on the, especially in the ground game. But the defense really stiffened up. It had a lot of uh, it. You could tell that they made a lot of adjustments in terms of like gap integrity and you know adjusting to how Michigan was playing the game. And we were able to really just shut down their offense for the last uh, you know probably three quarters of the first half. Um, Rutgers' offense also looked alive. Gavin you know was making a lot of accurate passes, especially deep. Um, mm-hmm. We had the, the the we were finally we finally got that crazy special teams turn or special teams play we were waiting for all all, all season when we had the punt block return for a touchdown, um, just everything seemed to be breaking Rutgers' way and then halftime happened, and then uh, it was truly a tale of two games because Rutgers was winning seventeen fourteen at the half Rutgers did not score another point the rest of the game Michigan ended up scoring fifty one, so Richie. Tell me a little bit about what you saw in this game and why things really just kind of broke completely the opposite way for Rutgers in the second half. Uh, yeah, you kind of mentioned everything already. The first half, beautiful. Second half, yikes. Um, a, lot, a lot of positives to take away from this. At the end of the day, um, this is the number five team in the country, which is probably going to be number three or four when uh, the new college football playoff rankings come out this week. Uh, but – yeah, no, this is a hell of an effort by Rutgers. I really thought they had a chance of winning this game. Um, they played phenomenal in the first half. The defense is kicking on all cylinders, and, and some of these guys, like Shiano's getting the most out of these guys as much as he can. Uh, they'll fight for him. They'll fight to the death for him, it seems like, actually. Now a couple mistakes here and there. They gave up a, one touchdown where I think it was uh, Braswell got beat. There was another one where Igbenosin got beat. And then uh, – uh, the, obviously, on offense, like things things were looking good with Wimsat. He was throwing the ball really well. He's hitting accurate passes. Yeah, he kind of sailed a couple, but that's that's expected. Again, he's a freshman, pretty much, so you can't expect too much out of him. Uh, but we saw glimpses of what he could be. Now, second half hit, and it's like boom, 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 one, two, three picks, and it's like oh shit, like what just happened? Um, one of those I don't blame him for because it did hit off the receiver's hands or receiver's arms, whatever you want to call it. Um, the other two were just bad mistakes. It did seem like he rushed a couple things, but uh, and that was kind of the downfall from then on out. That twenty-eight point third quarter was just it was it was brutal. I think they scored what three times within a minute thirty at one point. Um, so that so that kind of screwed them over. Now with the ups, there's also downs. The run game is nothing without Sam Brown. Like it's it's non-existent. Even with Aaron Young back, um, they were trying everything. They tried Rashad Rochelle at one point. It kind of worked a little bit. I'm surprised they didn't give him a couple more. Like, carries well, it did work the, the, the first time, but then I think they tried it one or two more times, and he yeah. got totally blown up. So the first time it was like, oh, we caught him off guard. The other times, as soon as they line up like yeah. that, they know what's happening. So it's the same problem the Johnny Langan package has. It's it's interesting. It's just crazy how much of a drop-off there is between Brown and everyone else on this team. So it is. They do have a dire need for a running back, and obviously they're getting one next class in Benjamin. But um, 
it, it's tough. Maybe I look into the portal with some Rutgers and try to get like a one, two punch and you got to get someone that's willing to split carries with Brown because at the end of the day, like Brown, Brown's the guy. Um, but yeah, no, the receivers actually look decent at times. Now, now when I say the receivers, I mean, Chris Long, Brian and Chris Shank, the rest of the receiver group just is non-existent as well. So, so they need some weapons there. And, uh, I mean, I might be throwing Krupschenk in that category as, like, a good game. It was just probably an average game for him, if I had to say. Um, but Sean Ryan looked solid. Chris Long looks like he has potential down the line. Um, everyone else, there's just there's no one there. And it, it makes you question why Rochelle left, uh, why he's at running back, why Fitzroy or Fitz- Legister kind of – I kind of assumed he had shitty hands, and that's probably why they moved him to defense. If he had good hands, he'd be on offense. Um, so, yeah, they, they need some help there as well, and it's uh, – it's getting interesting, but the defense, I can't, I can't rave about it enough. I know you can't really blame them for the 28 points in the third because, I mean, all three picks were what? In, not in the red zone, but pretty damn close to the red zone. Yep. So, uh, yeah, this defense played on all cylinders. Uh, Deion Jennings got dinged up. Jameer Wright Collins came in and played phenomenal. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Like, the, the entire defense was just great. Like, yeah. I, I have no complaints whatsoever about them. And, and it goes to show you, if they can get this offense fixed somehow, this team, this could be a Rutgers again from like the original J- Shiano 1.0 era. Rant over. I'm done. Yeah, no, I, I so I, I, I think there are certainly flashes on offense that you really can point to as this is what it could be. The offense still really struggled throughout the whole game, though. I think we had 11 three and outs on our drives. The, we had eight drives in the second half that either ended in a three and out or a turnover. Mm-hmm. So, there's still a long way to go with this offense. I think part of that is continuing to shore up our offensive line. Like, there's some guys on that line who are just really struggling right now. Like, Dunlap. Car- Carlos Dunlap is just a turnstile at right guard. Um, Willie Tyler's had a lot of struggles. He was better today than he had or yesterday. Yeah. I'm sorry, Saturday than he had been previously. Mm-hmm. But still, this offensive line is still fairly porous. And the thing they say about offensive lines, it's not necessarily like about your best player. It's about your worst. If you have one hole on your offensive line, that is just something that as a defense, you can really target and just wreak havoc through. If you have, I'd rather have five average guys on the, on the offensive line than two studs, two total turnstiles and one average guy, because the turnstiles will just create yeah. uh, penetration in the backfield all game long. Um, I do think that Gavin sort of crumbled a bit when that first turnover happened. Like, mm-hmm. there was a really bad throw. It was supposed to, he, I think he read it as a hitch, and Sean Ryan was running a post, or he threw it too early. I don't know, but it was clear that they were not on the same page. And then there's two more interceptions, a lot of just, like, happy feet in terms of throwing the ball early. Um, the the <laughs> I think it was still early on in the second half when he had that uh, second and two. He scrambled to his right. And instead of just throwing it into, you know, Mercer County, he ran out of bounds <laughs> for a five-yard loss, setting up a third and seven. There's just, like, a lot yeah. of mental mistakes he still makes. And he's I get that he's 19, but he's got to make big leaps and bounds this offseason in terms of his processing and in terms of his just football IQ. Because mm-hmm. I get that that comes with reps, but at the same time, we need to see rapid improvement because if he doesn't – take a huge jump next year, offense is going to be even in even more trouble. Um, but that being said, the defense, I, I agree, played fantastic, especially after they made those quick, those adjustments early on in the game, because that those first two drives by Michigan, where they were just, you know, marching down the field with the rushing game, it, it really looked like Rutgers was in, in for a long day. Um, but then they started stiffening up on, on the goal line and, um, for as much uh, as our goal line defense doesn't look great statistically, we've had mm-hmm. multiple games now against Ohio State, against Michigan, where we're forcing these guys into fourth down and goal from, like, the one after stuffing them multiple times. And, like, you only do that if you have, like, you know, guys who are playing hard or pretty talented and you're scheming things up well. Um, so I think they scored two touchdowns in the first half on fourth and goal. Um, I think – you could say that three of our players made the biggest plays of their career so far, or at least the, the best, in my opinion. Tareem Powell stopping Corum on third and goal in the hole. Just like Corum leapt, leapt up and Tareem Powell just stonewalled him for the stop. Um, I'd say Chris Long's 39-yard catch was probably the best play of his career, considering the defense he was playing against. Yeah. And then I'm going to say Corsak might have had his best punt of his career when you know Michigan, Michigan defender was was – Honing in on him, looked like he was going to be a block punt. He somehow avoids him and punts this like 
you know, perfect punt uh, as he's getting hit, and it goes 55-plus yards, and it's down at, like, the 15-yard line. Just insane wizardry from him, which has been continued the last few games. I think he's really stepped it up another notch. Um, and that's debatable, obviously, because Corsak's had a lot of really good punts throughout his career. But I just – I think you're seeing flashes from more than, you know, one area. Like, before it was just, you know, you, we saw a flash from Shane Brown, and then that was kind of it. This game, I feel like we had a lot of young guys flash, which is really encouraging. Yeah, no, you, you kind of said it all about this game. Uh, obviously not pretty, but a lot of youth movement coming through. Um, like I said, Rashad Rochelle, I know it was only one carry, but it seems like he's going to be a pretty good one when he gets the ball in space. Chris Long looks really good. Uh, Jameer Wright Collins looks like he might be, able to guy, might be able to be that guy that could step up next year and may, might be able to run three linebacker sets for a change. With Moses Walker returning as well, so yeah, that, sh- that should help things a, l- a little bit. Right now, you're down to what two, third, three, if you count Jameer Wright Collins, who's kind of still learning his position. Trent or transferred over from the offense. What week two, week three? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Um, you return a lot of guys next year too in the secondary, like Christian Izian, Malachi Melton. Yeah, you lose some in Avery Young and Braswell, but. You got to be able to replace those guys. That's where maybe a, lo- maybe a longer beam steps up. Uh, Shaquan Loyal's been playing a lot of snaps lately. Um, yeah, I mean, th- there's there's a lot of optimism for this team, despite the 30, what was it, 30, 40, no, 35 point loss? Somewhere around there. If they're, despite the 35 point loss, there is still a lot of optimism coming through this team. And you, you can see why. There's a lot of good names that are like coming through the ranks. And they're, you're seeing development for a change, which is always nice to <laughs> nice to see. Um, which you kind of expected for years now, and now you're finally starting to see it under a new regime, new old and regime. I, and I also think you see why uh, Chiano and staff really s- stuck with Vegel as long as they did, because mm-hmm. it is so easy for a game to get out of hand when you commit a lot of turnovers. Like, if you look at what happened with Iowa, if you look what happened with uh, this game, if you look at what happened with, with Minnesota, a close game can easily turn into a route given one or two really – untimely turnovers and mm-hmm. Vedral did not do that. He, he would, you know, take a three and out with three sacks over putting a ball in harm's way. Most of the time I say most of the time, cause sometimes it happens, but yeah. um, I don't think that's what it ultimately cost Rutgers this game. Those turnovers. I think Gavin really showed, you know, he's, he's making plays downfield that Vedral probably can't right now. Um, but we have to clean up turnovers. We have to clean up penalties because those are still two huge problems. And those are kind of cultural for as, for as much as I know Shiano instills, you know, the, the balls, the program and discipline, the players haven't really shown they have either this season, which needs to be cleaned up and will come with, with growth and time, but it's still alarming to see as many penalties and as many turnovers as we are with Rutgers right now. Yeah, but before we go any really further past this game, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Winsat. And you said development wise, um, I think I hate to say I think Nunzio might be the guy. He might be the guy to like develop. It's you know, I keep looking back at his like previous like jobs. So he's he's developed Matt Sims, Mike Teal, Gary Nova in high high school. Jarek Warrantano's in the league. Uh, maybe not the best college career to compare to, but he's in the league now. He made Johnny Langan look good at one point in high school. He had seven. All state quarterbacks at, at uh, under Bergen Catholic's regime, like it, it's not the worst option in the world, and it does seem like he knows what he's talking about in terms of quarterbacks. And then you go and offer a quarterback and Jack, Jack Rooster, who also has connections to the group to the Campanelli. So it's it's starting to look like I don't, I don't want to speculate too much yet because it is obviously there's still a couple games left. So he could just fall there completely, but it does start to look like Campanelli is making a pretty solid pitch for this job. I'm going to push back because I don't think he's really done anything that inspires me to have any hope whatsoever. Like, I know it's been just three weeks that he's been the coordinator, I guess four, because mm-hmm. including the bye. Like, but I think they've scored, what, a combined 34 points in three games under his his uh, his lead as the offensive coordinator. Rutgers is going to have money. Like, they can't just go in and see – like, they need to have one game where it's like, wow, the offense really clicked today. We saw a flash of it. On Saturday, we didn't see any of it against Minnesota and against um, – who do you play out of by? It's skipping uh, yeah. right now. And it's against Indiana, like, you know, we had a few decent drives, but ultimately, like, you know, we still didn't – we were down in a 14-point hole most of the game. We came back in the fourth quarter mainly due to, to you know, our defense shutting them down. So 
it's partially a personnel problem. I get that, but we're going to have options in the off season. And I think there's going to be experienced guys that have a lot of interest in this job, mainly because we could offer money and mainly because Shiano's not going anywhere. And a lot of people want to coach or participate in the best, we're one of the best leagues in the country has the biggest TV package in, in the big 10. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we should settle for, for Nunzio unless, and that's what it would be right now, in my opinion, is, is settling. Um, but obviously, yeah, no, right, I, long I agree season. with you. I just, it just makes a lot of sense right now, just because I think everyone keeps talking about the fact that, like, the, the one quarterback you offer, a lot of connections to the Campanelli's. He's been working with none since he was, like, in fourth grade. So Wasn't he originally like, at BC, too, or Bergen Catholic? He, so. he, he was under Vito Camp and then uh, left, went to Ramapo. So, I mean, that, that's interesting as well. But I, I guess that kind of, like, takes us into the 2023 commit, if you want to talk about him. Or 2024. Well, 2024. Yeah. yeah. So we got our first commitment of the 2024 class, uh, who is a former high school teammate of fellow Duran, of Delran um, high school graduate, uh, Kenny Fletcher. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're getting in this uh, this commit. Yeah, so I actually asked him if he talked to Kenny at all about uh, Rutgers. He goes, uh, I've never, like, really talked to Kenny like that. I was like, okay. Really? Well, I, fa fair enough. Like, I, I get it. Like, you're teammates, but, like, you probably might not. You don't have to be best friends with everybody on the team. Um, but, no, Kenny Jones, is he's a solid prospect. Um, I think he's a good early prospect. He's a guy that you kind of – it's going to be a developmental piece, like most offensive linemen. It's going to take him a couple years in the program in order to contribute. Uh, he's, he's massive. He's 6'5", like 3'. 10 maybe maybe a little less maybe a little more depending on what they they talk to him but uh yeah i mean they run they run an interesting offense last year they ran uh for 20 what, I just had to pull up. they had 29 2300 rushing yards last year under garrett lucas their former head coach who's not there anymore this year they're struggling a little bit they're one and nine um but yeah no i mean he, he's a solid prospect he's big he's massive he's long um uh, he, he's everything you want in an offensive lineman he's he's a good early get uh, like I said, he's probably like top 30 in the state around now, if I had to guess something around there. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you, you didn't beat out anyone special. I know a couple of day, other programs, bigger programs showed some interest, but he only had a temple in UConn, but, uh, you get back in South Jersey, you get back, um, hopefully, uh, in that area completely because you need help, um, ever since Fran Brown left down there, uh, recruiting has been a struggle, but, uh, it, it's a good start. Uh, I think. You're going to have to aim a lot higher for the rest of this class, but it is a very good start to get Kenny Jones early on. So what is he coming in uh, as? Is he going to be a guard? Is he going to be a tackle? Have they not uh, really decided yet? They, they haven't decided yet. I think probably guard, if I had to guess. Um, he doesn't move extremely fast, so he kind of reminds me of like a smaller version of Curtis Dunlap. Obviously, Dunlap was a lot better in high school than he is, but uh, – yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell because Delvarian does, again, doesn't play the, the best conference or best uh, schedule either. Yeah, they play some of the big names in, like, the the, the Willing Burrows and uh, that that's it, really, <laughs> down, down South Jersey. Um, they don't they don't play anyone really that strong. So it's hard it's hard to gauge when you're, like, 6'5", 3'10", going against, like, a 5'11", 240-pound defense bend. It's like, oh, well, cool, yeah, you can push that guy around. Can you push your against the bigger guys? I kind of hope he's I, – I hate to say it. Like, I wouldn't be mad if he transferred because it would be nice to see him go up against some better comp. But uh, end of the day, I mean, uh, like I said, it's a good early get. It gets you into 24 class, and it kind of kicks things off because the recruiting just keeps getting pushed up more and more and more now. So we're seeing – what would I say the other day? There's like 70-something uh, kids already committed to Power 5 programs. Like, it yep. just keeps getting pushed up every single year, and it's it's kind of insane. Yeah, no, this would have been a very early commitment even five years ago, but now it's kind of like this is around the time kids regularly start to commit um, in their junior year. Um, in the past, it used to be you would go to, like, visits on in, like, the spring of your uh, your commitment year, and then you start to mm -hmm. commit then. But we've uh, definitely changed the timeline on this. Uh, he's, a, he's a big kid, so um, he's still got a lot of time to, you know, uh, even improve his, his body composition. I don't know if he's, you know, what he what he looks like in person, but um, given how young he is, he still has plenty of time to, to worry about that. Um, yeah, and, and his family loves the idea of him staying home, and I think that was the, one of the biggest factors when talking to him. He just basically said, my family wants me here, so I'm staying here. And I'm like, all right, cool, I respect that. Like, 
that me that basically tells me that he's not going anywhere unless a, unless Alabama comes and offers him. Which I don't even know if he'd still. I mean, he'd probably flip for that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's basically you know ninety percent of recruits in the country. Um, I'm, yeah, go, I'm gonna go there unless Alabama, Alabama comes calling. Yeah. And soon that might be Georgia because it seems like Alabama's uh, falling off a little bit. Yeah, but yeah. Brian Brown, look at that. Brian Brown Brown effect. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm honestly shocked that that they're as good as they are again this year, given how much mm-hmm. talent they lost last year. Yeah, it's um, crazy. Because normally that's like how Alabama works. Like they could have, you know, they could lose Tua, they could lose Jalen Hurts, they could lose like three first round picks at wide receiver. They could lose two offensive tackles. They go in the first round the next year. They're the favorite again. And that's mm-hmm. basically what's happened with Georgia this year. Yeah, um, pretty much. So I know I said we have, uh, we want to talk basketball too, but I, I kind of want to veer off a side ramp here and talk wrestling. So wrestling, uh, they have their first match on Friday. They've been doing like some, I don't, I wouldn't say it's called a scrimmage um, uh, in wrestling, but, they did something with, with Princeton and a few other smaller yeah. schools recently this week um, where it was basically like an open, I guess you would call it. It doesn't count towards season standings, but um, a lot of guys got to wrestle. And I was kind of blown away by how awful this out-of-conference schedule is for Rutgers. Uh, and I'll just kind of throw some <laughs> some matches at you guys. So we play our first game – we play our first match – we compete in our first match on Friday at the barn – and we're, pl- we're wrestling at the barn because there's a scheduling conflict with women's basketball at the rack. So, first of all, from a financial standpoint, Rutgers, ba- Rutgers wrestling is going to basically sell out the rack for a wrestling match. And women's basketball, I'm going to go out on a limb and say they will not this year. So, financially, it's a bad decision. Why not move that to Saturday, to Thursday, to any night you could have it at the rack over women's basketball? I think that's a colossal mistake. We wrestle four times, four times in the state of New Jersey this season before we wrestle at the rack. So we wrestle at College Ave Gym, we wrestle at the Prudential Center, we wrestle at Princeton, and we wrestle at Ryder before we actually have a match at the rack. We only wrestle four times at the rack all year, and they're all for Big Ten. So what are we doing? Why are we wrestling at Bloomsburg? Why are we wrestling, you know, at uh, Cal Bakersfield? Why are we wrestling at Stanford? Why are we wrestling at... Bethlehem High School, which is a real thing, by the way. We're wrestling <laughs> Sacred Heart and Arizona State at Liberty High School in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. What the fuck is this schedule? Like, I, Scott Goodale is probably the most successful coach we have in our athletic department right now, and this schedule is a slap in the face to him. And nobody's telling me to say this, but this schedule is complete garbage. And I, if I was Scott Goodale, I'd be so furious at what they've made him wrestle this year because this is not a schedule that, like, a – a team or a program that is as highly regarded as Rutgers wrestling should be forced to deal with. That's the end of my rant. Um, yeah, no, you're right. If you watch the press conference, he's, you can tell like he's not going to say it out loud, but he's not fucking happy about it. I wouldn't be happy about it either. Like Clarion, whatever. Maybe you're not selling out the rack against Clarion, but it's a season opener, so you, you might actually sell out the rack. Um, you, have, you have a really great team this year. Arguably, people are saying this might be one of Rutgers' better teams of, of the Scott Goodell era. Overall, from top to bottom, I'm not saying obviously two Serena, Ashnault, whatever. Yep. But like you're just you're gonna screw them over with like no offense to women's basketball program, but they're not drawing a thousand fans. Nope. This program's gonna draw. What, it's gonna fill the rack. What, what's the yeah. rack hold? Eight thousand. Eight thousand. We I think we've had like four thousand season ticket holders for wrestling the last few years. I know it is down a little bit this year. I will admit that, and that's probably because the recent season wasn't the best in the world. But still, you're still gonna get a shit ton of people there. Concessions alone, you'll make more money there. If it's all about the dollar sign, if you really want to do that, instead you're going to pack what, 400 people, maybe if, if that, at the College Avenue gym. Something I don't know like that. that. Place holds like it's not anything near a thousand. Like so, now you're screwing over season ticket holders, number one, because now not only are you getting four matches, one of those fucking matches is at College Ave. So have fun with that one. Yep. Where are you parking? Yeah. Behind the, behind the gym, like okay, students are there because it's a Friday. Like students yep. are going to be parking everywhere, so. You're screwed there in that aspect. Then the high school one. I don't know what the hell went into that one. Like, how could you not host that at the rack? I That is unforgivable in my eyes. Like, that's that's a bad one. Our season opens on Friday. We don't wrestle at the rack for over two months. 
Over two months after the season starts, we have 12 separate matches set up, and those are duels yeah. and singles that we wrestle before we wrestle at the rack. We wrestle fi against 15 separate teams before we wrestle against the rack. Unforgivable. Yeah. Unforgivable. I'm, I'm just, I want to keep going down this list. Stanford, whatever. I get that. That's fine. I, I'm okay with that one. Cal Bakersfield, you're out there already, so whatever. You just wrestle another California program. That's cool. They're big-name programs. You beat Stanford. That's huge in a duel. Garden State Grapple, I like the idea. Shitty opponents, though. Like, you're telling me you went from UNC to UPenn? Like, come on. Whatever, Prudential. Okay, cool. But then, I don't know whose thinking this was. That, like, hey, you know what? We're, we're wrestling Ryder at Ryder. We're wrestling uh, Princeton at Princeton. So, you know, that's in Jersey. That kind of counts. We don't need more home matches. Like, no, what the fuck? Yeah, you do. Like, yeah. What the hell happened here? And then the Bloomsburg one blows my mind. Yeah. How the hell could you not convince them to come to Rutgers? I, even if it's a payday, right? it's like, that's what programs do. You pay the lower shitty programs, be like, hey, you're coming to our place because we are no shot in hell are we going there. No shot in hell am I going to a high school gym. And now, yeah. no shot in hell am I playing a college ad or wrestling a college ad. Move that. Move that to a different date. Like, what are you doing? I'm, oh God. I'm dumbfounded by Dumb, the schedule. Yeah, like, that's just ridiculous. And then it's um, like, all right, yeah, here's three in a row in January. Have fun. Like, yeah, those are all Big Ten matches, so those were like yeah. set up by the conference, so it's not even like yeah. they had control. Like those are going to be great matches. Don't get me wrong, but this is just... no, I know, but absolutely insane and asinine, and I, I don't get it. Like I, I don't, I don't get it. the high school. I don't get. It. I like, and to give you guys context, like last year, you know, we started off with the quad at the rack. And we, we, we always do these, like, Garden State Grapple events. We always do, like, you know, the um, the Midlands Tournament. Like, those are regular things, but throw them a bone, man. Like, get some matches at Jersey Mike's. Like, that is one of the biggest advantages in, uh, you know, in, in terms of, like, a home crowd yes, in Mike's. college wrestling. Like, <laughs> like it is the, big, the easiest way to recruit is having, you know, it could be a top kid in the Northeast, which is, you know, one of the best – wrestlers in the country and they go to a you know a wrestling match that has six to eight thousand people the only time you see that is that like you know boardwalk call for the states like that's mm -hmm. the only time they get to experience that and they see that for like a regular match at Rutgers. i don't know i'm just i'm furious for and him don't so. don't even think about bringing recruits to the fucking barn that place is i don't yeah. even know if they have possessions like what the hell do you do is there the bathroom even work there uh i, I haven't been to the barn in, like, in years since i probably was a student rightfully so, so. you don't yeah. need to there's no reason to shut it down yeah um so i'd rather them wrestle at the fucking practice facility it's i'd rather beautiful. have them i'd rather have that be a wrestling match like you know at the at uh, shi like why not like have it at the football stadium Rutgers football isn't playing there this year or this weekend sorry they're at michigan state what's the point like have it outside not a bad idea Anyway, um, yeah, just I feel for I feel for Goody because this is uh, this is garbage. But let's move on to good news. Uh, basketball tips off tonight yeah. uh, for its, its opening night. We play at seven o'clock against Columbia, which I think had four wins last year. I think four. Ken Palm. I think Ken Palm wise, they're in the bottom twenty-five teams. Uh, so this is another basically a, a scrimmage, and hopefully the scrimmage is not one that bites us in the ass again. Um, but I, I, I feel good about this game. Um, it should be like the Fairfield team we played in the scrimmage is a much better team than any of our first by three opponents for basketball. Um, so this should be a nice tune up. Uh, obviously it sounds like Caleb McConnell <clears throat> is going to be out the first few games. Uh, still mm -hmm. recovering from, uh, whatever knee tweak he had. Um, I don't know exactly what happened. But I, I don't want to speculate either. But it sounds like he'll be back probably like mid November. That's up for debate now. Now it's hearing like it might be a little worse than we thought. But uh, we'll we'll see. Um, it does sound like he's going to miss the first three a hundred percent. After that, there's a big question mark. Do you force him back for Temple? I don't think you need him for Temple personally. I'd probably bring him back for Central Connecticut State because Riders Riders Rider. Central yep. Connecticut State, let him get his feet wet a little bit, shake off the rust, and then right back for Miami. And then you need him for Miami. If you don't have him for Miami, I'm, I'm going to count that one as an L. Well, I mean, it gets that's when the schedule goes from, you know, you know, sleepwalking to really intense really quickly because we play at Miami. You know, we have a home tilt versus Indiana, which is the, the Big Ten opener. Then mm -hmm. we play at Ohio State. We play Seton Hall at home, Wake Forest at home. And then the schedule softens a bit around the new year. 
Yeah. Um, can, we, can we talk about how the Big Ten was like, you know what? Rutgers Big Ten opener. We're going to give them the predicted champs of the conference. Fuck it. I mean, Have fun. <laughs> that's happened to us the last few years. Like, we had that's... to face Illinois super early in the season on the road. Yeah. I think we had to play Michigan super early on, on the road one year. Um, we just they get just, screwed with scheduling a lot. They, yeah, they hate Rutgers. It is what it is. But uh, team team looks great. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if Derek Simpson – that's my bold prediction today. Simpson's going to lead the team in scoring because you, there's no reason to play Cliff significant minutes against a team that has, what, six, eight big man tops? Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm just guessing because that's basically what all the shitty teams have. It's like a here's your six, seven, six, eight big man. Let Cliff get his 10, 10, 10 maybe in the first half, and then uh, let Simpson go have some fun. Don't go nuts. I, I could see him getting like a solid 16, 17 tonight. I, I really think he's he's going to show tonight, and people are going to – you're going to temper expectations after this one. I get it. Like if he's going to score 17 – He's the, he's the GOAT. He's the greatest thing ever. He's the freshman All-American. It's Columbia. So relax. But I do think he has a very big game tonight for Rutgers. And there's really no reason why he shouldn't. Yeah, so kind of uh, segueing into that, what are you hoping to see tonight that would be encouraging for you? Obviously, it should be a game that we should win by a large margin. So that let's, let's you know, put that aside as a given. We should win by a lot. But what are some of the things <laughs> you'd like to see out of this team that would make you think, okay, this is like a team that's way more talented or way a little better than I thought. Uh, I want to see the youth. I want to see the youth step up. Like we we know what Paul can do. He led the league in assists. We know what Caleb can do. Obviously, he's not playing. We know what um what Quiff can do. We we get it. Like we we know understand what those guys can do. I already kind of know what Cam can do based on his previous like uh, his tapes and stuff. And what have we seen in practice as well? Like, he is a very good shooter. I don't expect him to do a whole lot tonight. I wouldn't even, like, play him. But that whole starting lineup, I'm telling you, would not be playing a whole lot tonight. I'd be playing on, like, half the minutes of what I'd normally play them. And uh, I want to see the youth. I want to see a guy like Wolfolk. I know, like, it's going to be your first college game, but I want to see you step up at that five roll. And I want to see you take that five roll by the reins so then we can kind of move, like, uh, Reber around a little bit. You can play him at the back of five. You can play him at the back of four. Um, I want to see the bench step up. This this bench had zero points in the last two games of the season. And one of those games was in overtime. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't it multiple overtimes? Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's bad. Like, that was bad last year. So that can't happen again. Hyatt, try to get a little comfortable. Reber, do your thing. Show people that you can shoot the shit out of the ball. Uh, Wolfolk, I want to see some dominant paint presence out of him. I want to see this whole bench unit just be the stars tonight. I don't. I, I know we all know who the stars are of the team. I want to see these other guys step up and be those stars for, for a change, especially in the first two games against two opponents that are in the 300s in Kempom. Like, it's – I know that Columbia is better because they finished the season 350 last year out of, like, 353. Uh, now they're 316 this year, so they're, they're better, but they're still not good. Like, you should be dominating this team, and I, I want to see this youth movement on display tonight. I want to see Chol out there. I want to see – I want to see Oscar get some minutes out there and just go be a high flyer. Get, show your confidence a little bit. And uh, t- take the shots. Like, t- if you're open, take these shots. Don't pass them up. I know that's like this team likes to be pass heavy. It seems like in practice, and they might they might make one too many passes, which isn't a bad thing. But it's like, take the shot. Like, if you're open against these guys, take the shot. You can drive to the rim. Uh, I just want I want to see the youth. That's it. I want to see it on display, and I I think it's going to be on dis- on display as well. Yeah, um, I th- I think we should get the opportunity to kind of clear the bench at, at some point. Um, but for me, I really want to see how this offense has evolved in the last year. I know we've heard a lot of rumblings about certain players and you know certain things that they're getting better at. But I want to see like philosophically and schematically how we've designed a different offensive game plan around our, our you know our significantly different um, player pool this year because this is probably the biggest change Rutgers has had in terms of um, you know players in terms of a uh, like Pike's entire tenure here. Like he's losing like two Rutgers legends and in, in Geo and, and Ron Harper Jr. But we've we've gotten some, you know, obviously Cliff's gonna be a lot better this year. We've gotten a guy in Cam Spencer who I, I is a type of player that we haven't really had while Pike's been here at Rutgers. So it'll be interesting yeah. to see how the offense is different with those new factors and is you know, is it is it is it more of like a, a pick and pop game? Is it you know how how uh, there's a lot that I could like throw out there, but I just want to see what they've kind of crafted up. Cause Pike has said they didn't really show a lot during the scrimmage. Uh, I don't think they'll really need to go deep into the bag in these first few games, but it would be nice to just see that like, Oh, he, 
he's using this guy to his full extent of his abilities, like a guy like Cam Spencer or a guy like Derek Simpson, et cetera. So really excited just to see how the offense has changed this year because you know what the defense is going to be. The defense is going to be high pressure. It's going to be – Pike said he hasn't been happy with the rebounding last few years, um, mm-hmm. even though we've been above average in terms of, of rebounding. So – be, like we kind of know what to expect out of a Pike defense, but we'll see what this offense looks like uh, this year. Yeah, that's probably the main concern, and that's where a guy like uh, Brandon Knight's got us. I know he's doing phenomenal on the recruiting trail, but you got to step up in terms of coaching. He's he's running this offense. He's a uh, basically the man in charge on the bench. That's not Pikeel. He's he's a second in command, and uh, we got we got to see this offense uh, take off from the beginning. Now you don't have to do much against this team. Like I said, they're they're really bad, but. Uh, Show a couple, so like a couple plays here and there, because you don't want to reel a whole lot either. So it's it's it is tough. It's like a there's a fine line you don't want to cross in terms of showing too much offense. But uh, I, I think you'll see this team hit a couple transition. They're going to go in transition a lot because they're just all fast. Um, yep. Maybe not the guards, but which is awkward for a change. But uh, yeah, I, th- I think there, there's a lot of question marks still on this team. Is, is Caleb okay? Is is Cam's missed a lot of time as uh, at Loyola too with injuries? Um, what's the drop off like from Ron the Mag? Um, will, will Cliff get in the, stay out of foul trouble? So I mean, there's still a lot of issues here. Free throws were an issue a couple of years ago; they've gotten better. But uh, I, I think this is another tournament team, and I don't see a reason why it shouldn't be. Um, I know people are criticizing my my ten and ten prediction and conference on the on the boards, but like ten and ten, this this Big Ten conference is good from top to bottom, no matter what you say. Down year or not a down year, it's still a very good team, a very good conference, and it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's it's going to be a good conference. I don't think they'll be as good as last year. I, I agree with no. the general consensus that they're probably taking a sli- slight step down, but they're going from like the clear best conference to maybe the second best conference, maybe the third at absolute worst. Like the Big Twelve's got a, a pretty top heavy conference this year. The ACC has obviously mm-hmm. got a few programs in transition. But you got North Carolina, you got Duke. They're, they both should be top 10 teams this year. Um, but I think the national media is sleeping on Rutgers a bit. You, you obviously have the, the bus driver, Andy Katz, who's always giving Rutgers its props. But you got a guy like Jeff Goodman, who is one of the guys on Geo Baker's podcast. Uh, he picked Rutgers to finish 11th in the Big Ten this year, which I think is an absolute slap in the face. Um, I think Rutgers should finish top half of the Big Ten again this year, assuming that we don't if, – if, if Caleb has a prolonged injury, that's a big – you know, changing factor for my prediction here. And if Cam Spencer doesn't become the offensive player that I think he's capable of being at Rutgers, that might change my opinion. But I don't see any way that Rutgers finishes in the the bottom half of the Big Ten this year. And that means they probably should be a tournament team again this year. I think predicting, like, a specific record is tough. But I I think they should finish right around 500 in conference. I think they finished with 20, 21 wins uh, overall. I don't see any reason that they shouldn't. Um, So... I'm really excited for basketball. It's a nice reprieve from all this depressing football we've had to watch uh, at Rutgers this year. Um, yes. Because a four and five record looks fine, but when you realize that, you know, we started three and oh, so we've gone one and five in the last month, it's just, it wears you down, man. Like, I know that you're a journalist first at this point, but you were a Rutgers grad, you're a Rutgers fan. Like, oh, it's, it's, it's brutal to watch. Like it's it's not fun from a co- coverage standpoint either. No. It's like you're sitting there and you're like, oh, here we go. First first down, run. Second down, attempted pass incomplete. Third down, run. Fourth down, punt. Okay, cool. Hey, my favorite part of the game, of course. That. Yeah, and you're getting the same questions over and over, and you either and can't answer them. So that's like it's either you can't answer them or you answer the same way because nothing has changed. So yeah. Anyway, um, what are you gonna do? So we've covered a lot here. Is there anything that we missed that you wanted to touch on before we sign off? Uh, one thing, because I don't know if I'll probably forget to mention it on our preview pod later this week, who guess to be determined, I guess. Um, next Saturday, this Saturday, upcoming Saturday, Michigan State game, watch party, Olive Branch. Everyone knows the bar. If you don't know the bar, Google it. Like Google's your friend at this point. Yep. Uh, it's going to be a partnership between TKR, us, Night Report, uh, Night and Day Apparel, which is like uh, one of the Rutgers apparel companies, or I don't even know what you call them now. I, they, they make a bunch of Rutgers gear, all kinds of stuff. Um, they have the TKR t-shirts on there. They have a bunch of our uh, logos on there, like the Pike, lo- or Pike logo, the Night Call, which is my favorite. And then uh, also spot- and the Night Society. So the three of us are combining. We're running a watch party for the Michigan State game at Olive Branch Bar. 
Um, if you haven't been there, it's pretty good food. Um, always, always good drinks. Drinks are always flowing. Um, if you see me and uh, I'm a little tipsy, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> Or ask me some uh, insider stuff, and I'll try to answer as best as I can. Um, but in all seriousness, we got a bunch of giveaways. I actually got a couple of them back here, real quick. We got Rutgers socks to give away. Oh, we got nice! CKR T-shirts to give away, and uh, we got this um, authentic, completely authentic. I swear it wasn't from any other country or anything. This Ron Harper Jr. jersey. Oh, so nice! We're gonna, this, we're gonna be giving all this stuff away, and I swear it's straight from Adidas. Like I would never order from anywhere else. <laughs> uh, but no, we got a bunch of giveaway stuff, and that's just, that's just my part of the giveaway. So Nice Society is gonna give away a bunch of stuff. Um, obviously, Geo Baker is gonna be there. He's in charge of Nice Society. We're trying to get a. We can't get the hoops players there because UMass Lowell is that day as well. Um, so that's gonna be a little tough. But I, I do think uh, the Nice Society is working with a couple other athletes to get them there and. To show out, talk to fans, um, interact with people, and uh, that's this is what NIL is all about. It's about interacting with the players. It's it's not about pay for play that every other school is doing, like Miami and Texas A&M. I I didn't mean to name them, but I just did. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, NCAA, if you're bored, like go check out those two. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's going to be a really fun event, and I'm very excited for it. Um, it's going to be packed. It's, it's going to be completely packed, and. Uh, just come, come out to Olive Branch. I forget what time it is. I'll post it on the boards again. I think I posted it last week. It's on Twitter. Um, it's basically everywhere you can find it. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, check it out. Yeah, night and day, they, they make some uh, pretty awesome uh, apparel too. It's, most of it, what they come up with for Rutgers is our unique design. So um, what they actually put on their website, you're not gonna probably find many other places. I bought a few shirts from them recently. Um, using the, the TKR 10% off code. So Rutgers rivals promo mm -hmm. code 10% off. There you yep. go. Forgot about that. Yep. So, um, uh, yeah, I would highly Starts recommend them. Starts, Starts at noon. noon. Got it. There you go. Figured it out. So, uh, yeah, like, like I said, come watch the game, bunch of Rutgers fans, athletes, um, my rants, I just going to keep going. I'm done. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, I'm sure Ruck, uh, Richie will have a lot of, uh, uh, members only rants on Saturday that you're only going to hear in person. Um, oh, so yeah, you can hear me rant about recruiting. It's yeah, yeah it's, that's for another day. Stuff that can't make it on the show or can't make it on the board. So it's definitely worth coming out to. Uh, it'll be a fun time. Uh, but for for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Night Report podcast. Signing off.